gentleman was visiting a penitentiary in his area for the purpose of encouraging the prisoners. They gave him permission to visit each cell and speak for a while with the inmates. As the visitor approached one cell, he observed inside the prisoner patching his prison guard. He was doing it the old-fashioned way with needle and thread. So looking for an opportunity to open the conversation, he looked at the prisoner and he said, what are you doing, sewing? And the prisoner paused and looked at him and said, no, I'm reaping. Now, what did he mean by that? Well, it was an interesting play on words. The fact of the matter is, the prisoner was sewing with needle and thread, his prison guard. But his response, I'm reaping, was broader and symbolic, and that he was showing he was in prison in the first place because he had lived a life of crime and he was reaping the results of his criminal life. Thus his answer was a factual one and one that expressed his true condition. Now, whether or not he knew this, and there's no way to say whether he did, that what he gave in his answer, I'm reaping, was in fact a principle that originated not with men, but that originated with God. And that in fact he was pronouncing, whether known or unknown to him, an unalterable principle that stated right in God's word, the Bible. Now, because it affects all of us, we'd like to invite you to take your Bible and open to that book of Galatians, chapter 6. And what you might do is just leave it open there because there are a number of points that we can consider from there that will be helpful. But now, let's first go to this immutable principle, this fundamental principle that affects all in life. Galatians 6. Now, look down at verse number 7. It says very simply, do not be misled. God is not one to be mocked, for whatever a man is sowing, this he will also reap. Now, pause a moment. We read the principle. We want to understand clearly what it means. He said, whatever a man is sowing, now, here that means living, what he's doing in life, that's like unto sowing, he says, this he will also reap. Now, the most interesting part about this divine maxim, that's how we can term such a principle here, is it applies everywhere. In other words, it's defining a rule put in place by God that says the beginning of something is related to the end. The start is related to the finish. Like begets like. For example, if you're a farmer and you sow wheat, you reap wheat. You're never going to pick a squash from a walnut tree, are you? Like begets light. Now, some might think, well, certain factors can change this principle. And that's the problem in understanding. It doesn't. For example, distance does not change this in the agricultural world or anywhere else. Sometimes watermelon vines will stretch out 20 feet from the main stalk. But that vine never forgets that it is a watermelon and it never puts anything else at the end of the line. It's never put a pumpkin 20 feet away. Because forgetting, I'm a watermelon stalk. See? The distance did not change it. It's not changed either by time. For example, they were doing some excavations over in Egypt. And you know, ancient pharaohs tended to bury everything with them when they died. They would have everything in there. And in the excavations... They found that uh, some wheat stalks were put in there with the pharaoh in one of its tombs. So the archaeologists took these wheat stalks, pulled the seeds from them, and planted them. 5,000 years later, wheat came up. You see, four or 5,000 years didn't make any difference. What you sow, 
is what you reap. Now, with that background, we're better able to understand the two prefatory remarks to that principle. Look at them again in verse number 7. The first said, do not be misled. In other words, it's saying, don't make a mistake here. Don't think that what is stated after this is something you can alter or change. Or don't feel, and this is where some make an error in life, that it doesn't apply to you. Now, look at the second prefatory remark, which is significant, and it shows it comes from God. It says, God is not one to be mocked. Let me give you the literal Greek on that, since that's how this was first written out. It literally meant God is not one to be fooled. In other words, it's saying here that here's someone that feels they can go contrary to this principle. They're more or less turning their nose up at God and mocking him. Now, this is not by some verbal scoffing, as some people might use obscenities or profanities and curse God. It's not talking about that. It's broader. Here, when it says God is not one to be mocked, it's talking about someone who will live a life contrary to what is indicated here in the Scripture from God, feeling that he somehow has outwitted God, that he's evaded the consequences of what God says. So it says here, God is not one to be mocked. You can't outwit him. Or as they put it in contemporary vernacular today, no one gets over on God. He doesn't play games. When he states this principle, it's going to apply everywhere. And this is the problem with many people today, particularly young people, because they feel they can adjust this. They feel they can sow one way in life, and reap or harvest a different result. It doesn't work anywhere in God's universe that way. But now, what about this is vital for you to understand, for all of us to understand? This is a divine maxim. It's an immutable principle from God. It's a fundamental principle of living in life. So why is it vital that all of us then understand it? Here's why. Because what it does here is it opens up before all of us a choice of lifestyles, and there are only two. In other words, before all of us there is open up two ways of living. One works, one does not work. The two are opposed to each other. You can't mix them. So that's why it's vital that we know the right choice to make. Now, what are the two choices? Well, you're holding to Galatians 6. Now, I'd like you to please look at verse 8. Now, carefully read this and see if you can distinguish the two lifestyle choices mentioned here. Galatians 6, 8. It says, because he who is sowing with a view to his flesh will reap corruption from his flesh. But he who is sowing with a view to the Spirit will reap everlasting life from the Spirit. Now, there are the two choices. It said you could either be sowing with a view to... Now, it used something in particular, and I hope you did not overlook it. Notice it says his Spirit, or selfishly what the person wants to do. Or he could be sowing or living according to the Spirit. We'll come to that in a moment, but let's take what it means to sow with a view to his flesh. If we're personalizing it, it means then your flesh. Now, here flesh does not mean body. Very often in the Bible, flesh is used to represent our imperfect, sinful human nature. In other words, our natural propensities are toward what is wrong and what is bad because we were born as sinners. And so here, when it's saying, he who is sowing with a view to his flesh, it means, note very carefully, he's living a life that involves pleasing his own flesh. Or in other words, doing what he wants to do, giving in to his weak, sinful, imperfect human nature. And the sad part about this is, that's how most people will live today. Whatever brings them pleasure, then they tend to indulge in it. Do they like sports? Then get all you can of that. Movies or television or many take it on into immorality. They live a promiscuous lifestyle. 
getting deeply involved in the immoralities of fornication, adultery, homosexuality. Others are into what they say material things and accumulating all of the wealth or financial power or money they possibly can. In other words, when it says sowing with a view to his flesh, it's talking about satisfying by indulging in the things that please the weak, sinful, fallen flesh. And what did you think of the results of it? He said, he who is sowing with a view to his flesh will reap corruption from his flesh. That's why we said one choice is not going to work. Now, what about the other lifestyle choice of living? It says, he who is sowing with a view to the spirit. So we're talking now, definite article here, we're talking about the spirit of God. And the person who is sowing with a view to the Spirit is someone who is allowing God's Spirit, His Holy Spirit, to guide and influence and affect his life and his decisions. In other words, even if he has certain inclinations toward pleasing the flesh, if these are out of harmony with what God says, then he's going to allow God's Spirit to make the decision and discipline himself to act in harmony with God's Spirit. He lives a life like that. He's sowing like that. And what are the results? It says that he who is sowing with a view to the Spirit or God's Spirit will reap everlasting life from the Spirit. They are the two. They're clearly set before us. Now, the fact of the matter is, everybody's doing one or the other, and you can't mix the two. Now, maybe someone might draw a wrong conclusion, and they may say, well, are you saying it's easy then? to follow the inclination of God's Spirit and resist the sinful inclinations of the flesh? No, we're not suggesting it's easy. In fact, it's just the opposite. It's hard. In fact, uh, you're in Galatians, get chapter 5, and uh, look at verse 17, and here we're told very specifically why it's hard. Galatians 5.17, it says, For the flesh, notice this, is against the spirit in its desire, and the spirit is against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, so that the very things that you would like to do, you do not do. You can't make it any clearer than that, can you? It's that they're opposed to each other. You cannot mix the two. So it says, if you're going to come out a winner... And so, with a view to God's Spirit, it says the very things, how did it put it, that you would like to do? In other words, very often, you don't do that, because that's sowing then in another direction. So, that's why it's vital for all of us. That's why this principle that was... Enunciated by that prisoner and their sewing his prison garb. I don't know where he picked it up. Maybe it took going to jail for him to realize that he can't outwit God or evade the consequences of wrong or bad actions. But this is how it works out in life. Now, let me tell you about a problem that happened in the congregations in that province of Galatia where we're reading about. There was a reason the Apostle Paul wrote them this counsel and other point. There are some principles there for us to learn. In the congregations, you basically had uh, two groups of Christians. Now, already that's divisive because Christians are all to be of one mind and think the same way, but... You, you had them at variance with one another. Now, on the one hand, you had certain ones who before they were Christians were religious Jews, and then they got the truth. And then you had others who had never even heard of uh, Jesus Christ and one God, and they were Gentiles, referred to uh, as, as pagans, and then they got the truth. Now, Paul showed that both of them, now notice this, and here is the crux of the matter. Both groups, unbeknownst to themselves, 
were sowing with a view to their own flesh, and they didn't even know it. They all, both sides, thought that they were solid in the truth. Now, let's get down to what their problem was. Now, take those Jews who had converted to Christianity. They were sowing with a view to their flesh by living a life of, and here's a word we'll use to describe it, legalism. Now, all this meant was they were putting their own slant on the truth. Now, here's how they were doing it. They had been Jews under the Mosaic Law. They converted and became Christians. But lifestyle-wise, they remained pretty much Jews. They still observe certain uh, festivals, and they continue to get circumcised. Their feeling was, well, uh, this was good under the law. No need to discontinue it. And that in itself wasn't the real problem. The real problem was that they felt everybody should do that that came in the truth. In fact, they felt, you're really not a Christian as a Gentile if you come in and you do not more or less adopt these things that were Jewish in custom. So they were judgmental. So they ended up then putting their own, and if we take the vernacular, spin on the truth, and they looked down on everyone that didn't follow that strict way that Jews did under the law. So, they were living a life of legalism. Now, why was it sowing with a view to the flesh? Well, they were in the truth, but they were not doing God's will God's way. They had the truth on their own terms. They added to it and judged others according to it. And so Paul wanted to show they were mixed up. That's why Christ had come. Are you in chapter 5 still? I hope you didn't close up. We're going to use this continuously. Let's try to get the sense of it, but go to verse number 1. And you won't have to keep paging back and forth if you keep it open to Galatians. I promised you that earlier. I'll stick to that. Go to verse 1. Now, notice what he told them there. Galatians 5, 1. He says, For such freedom Christ set us free. Therefore, stand fast and do not let yourself be confined again to a yoke of slavery. So, in other words, he showed they were taking backward steps when they were holding on to Judaism and trying to be a Christian at the same time. So it wasn't really the truth. Now, let's go to the other group. We said they were Gentiles. They never had heard about Christ or just one God. They worshiped many. So they came into the truth. But now they went to the other extreme. And these were congregations with two extremes. No, they weren't rigid and overly strict. They lived, and here's the terminology we'll use to describe them, a life of license. See, that's in contrast. The former Jews who became Christians were living a life of legalism, strictness, overly scrupulous, judgmental of others who didn't do things their way. But now, the Gentiles came in, and many of them tended to live a life of license. In other words, their point of view was... Well, now we have the truth and this freedom that comes through Christ. The truth has set you free. In other words, once they learned they weren't tied to all of those customs and all that the Jews were following, they didn't have to accept that, and that they were no longer bound by all the things they did while a part of paganism, then they went to the other extreme and they just did what they wanted. They abused it. They took it too far. Yes, there was Christian freedom, but it was not to be abused. It was not to be taken too far. And they pushed it to an extreme because they felt, well, if there isn't a specific law that says, thou shalt not do this, they said, well, it's up to your conscience. You do what you want. Don't go and commit any real sin, but anywhere you stay just this side of the real sin, well, it's up to you. You do what you have to do. And so that was the feeling that they promoted in the congregation. Now, the question then, after we see how they were doing these things, how does this affect us today? What do we learn from this? Okay, the fundamental principle we must learn is this. Christians do not go to either extreme in their service to God. In other words, if we're sowing with a view to the Spirit, God's Spirit, it doesn't lead us to the extreme to become judgmental 
and overly strict and scrupulous, or thinking that there is some special merit in self-denial, which there isn't, just do it, deny yourself just to be doing it. Neither is it do whatever you want as long as it doesn't bother your conscience and you don't consider it to be a real sin, such as some grave sin of immorality. Well, how could one fall into a trap today? That's what we want to call out of this, like the ancient Jewish Christians or the Gentiles who converted to Christianity. It's easy. Uh, in fact, it happens today. Some, it happens to them. They don't even know it's happening to them. They didn't know it back there. Those Jews who converted to Christianity, they thought really they were higher and better than everybody. Because they felt, well, we still keep the law and we're Christians believing in Christ. You can't get any higher than that. It's easy to fall into that trap today. How? And get into living a life of legalism or legal bondage as we read in the scripture. I'll tell you the quickest way how you can determine if someone is moving in that direction. And surely in saying it, you may even think of some who had such a point of view. You can quickly tell it when there's someone as a Christian who will take any suggestion. Maybe they read it in the kingdom ministry or some of the other publications. And uh, right away they convert it to a rule. And they convert a suggestion to a rule and then they start condemning and judging others by it. It could be something as simple as we've had the suggestion where you live. Would you please go to the congregation and territory where you live? And likewise, he said with the congregation book study. The elders draw them out. Go to the one that's nearest you. Don't pick and choose and go to another one. Uh, now, some make that a rule. And you show up in uh, a congregation that's not where you're living. And then you have some who, they have subtle ways of doing it. They may not be blatant in your face type of thing, but... They want to somehow let it be known you're not theocratic because you're not following what the law said. The law said if you live on this avenue, you go to this hall and this congregation. And if you do otherwise, you're a sinner. I just spelled it out. They don't come right up and put it that way. But they know how to put the pressure off. See, they convert suggestions to rules and laws. See, that's what legalism involves. In fact, they'll take almost anything. Take entertainment, sing films. Well, everybody knows you've got to be selected. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But these are people who go to extremes. And if there's any element that they can misconstrue to show bad, then they do it. I I'll give you an example. Sister took just some children. She took them to see uh, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Okay, about as innocuous as you're going to get nowadays going to film. So she told another sister, yeah, I took my children who went to see Snow White. What? Snow White? Don't you know dwarves is an ancient Anglo-Saxon word that meant devil and demons, and that if you take it, and the sister was just taken aback. She said, I just took my kids to see Snow White and seven dwarves. And now suddenly she's a great sinner. See, but that's how some are, you know. They go pounce off whatever it is and pass a judge. It doesn't make any difference what it is. It can be sports. It can be a hairstyle. It can be dress or grooming or what. But they're going to take everything and make it a law or a rule and not give any room for individual choice. It's all bad to them. And the problem is it's just like those ancient Jewish Christians. They're going to judge others by it. Now, I want you to look at a verse. You're still in chapter 5. Okay, now 90% are keeping those Bibles open. It's commendable. Now look at verse 4. He says, you are parted from Christ. Whoever you are that try to be declared righteous by means of law, you have fallen away from his undeserved kindness. Now, you can't get any clearer than that. So he said, if you're trying to make yourself righteous by law, and in application today, it means people who try to make their own set of laws put their personal spin on the truth, he said, if you're trying to do that, you've fallen away and missed the whole point of this freedom in Christ, this undeserved kindness. So we have to watch because what happens is you get people like that who think they're sowing with a view to God's spirit, 
when in fact they're sowing with a view to the flesh. It's the truth on their terms. And what pleases them? To see everybody living according to some personal standard that they have personally set up. That's not the law of Christ. That's not the undeserved kindness of God. That's not the balanced, moderate way that God brings the truth. Now let's go to the other group. I know you've been wondering about them. And that's those Gentiles that came in and they lived, uh, we said, a lifestyle of license. And license here is doing what pleases the flesh, as we read about in an earlier verse. Now look at verse 13. You're holding to chapter 5, and this is significant. He says, you were, of course, called for freedom, brothers. Now notice what he says. Only do not use this freedom as an inducement for the flesh, but through love slave for one another. Now, there's the vital point right there. Call to freedom? Yes. The truth sets us free. We're not blinded by superstitions and propaganda or religious bondage of false doctrines and ignorance. We're free from that. Fine. But he says, take care you do not use this freedom as an inducement for the flesh or an opportunity for the flesh or an occasion for the flesh. The synonyms I gave express the original language word in Greek, inducement. In other words, what it meant is, now don't take your freedom and say, well, I have this freedom in Christ, I'm not in bondage and ignorance is all of these things, and then use it as a springboard, and that's the thought from the original Greek word, to do things that aren't pleasing to God. See, maybe in the world, a person was in a religion, and there are these now that say, uh, you shouldn't drink any alcohol. Some of you came from the South, and you know there's a teaching. You drink a drop, you're drunk. You don't have any. So many people religiously thought, I don't drink at all, and they thought they were more holy and righteous than everybody else because they didn't drink. Now they come into the truth, and they learn, well, the Bible just condemns drunkenness. It doesn't condemn drinking. Have a drink if you want. But now, how could they use that freedom as an inducement for the flesh? Well, not just to have an occasional drink, but getting high. See, now, high is not drunk. Not yet. <laughs> Tipsy is not drunk, but you're getting close, right? And that's what he's talking about here. Don't take your freedom in Christ and use it as a springboard to go too far. No, it still would mean balance and moderate. See? And in almost any area, it could be taken too far. Take entertainment. We talked about those who were overly scrupulous, going around condemning everything, down to Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. But we all know that there's a lot of bad in movies, televisions, and videos. And the Bible, through our publications, have given us very good counsel. We don't want to watch films that feature nudity and simulated sexual intercourse and raw violence and ribald language, profanity, profusely throughout. No, we reject that. That's clear. But now, you know what's happening with some, and this is how some today could imitate those living a life of li a license, they take it too far. And we do know that some of our brothers and sisters are seeing almost everything. All you got to do is put a big soundtrack, have catchy music, put a big star or so in it, and even censors look at it and they rate it restricted, R, and they tell you now what's in it. Nudity, violence, language. But they say, well, it's just a few bad scenes. And the music's good. I like that star. That's where they're going to go. See, that is using the freedom as an inducement for the flesh because it goes too far. And it is designed to satisfy the flesh. Two sisters were sitting at uh, one of these films. 
They shouldn't have been there. Bad rating. And they told you anywhere you read or looked that this was really going to be rough. And one had already seen it and then took the other one. So you got to see this. And you know how when it's coming to your favorite part, if someone is there and they've seen it, they like that. And that's what she said. Get ready. Fasten your seatbelt, she said. We're going now. See, it's too far. How can someone who says they're sowing with a view to the Spirit and being influenced by God's Spirit sit in a theater or at home, watching by video or by cable, people on the screen nude having simulated sexual intercourse and call it entertainment. It's clearly too far. And that's what he's talking about. It can be pushed to that limit. Now, it's not just in matters involving morals. Some use this when it comes to materialism and the accumulation of money on material things. The Bible says if you have a family, you take care of your own or you're not a Christian. So it starts with that. But that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, in order to do this, you have to achieve the American dream. There's nothing wrong with this so-called American dream if it happens for you. But if one has to leave what is spiritual and focus on everybody working to accumulate things so as to have this middle-class lifestyle that is associated with the American dream and maintain this at the expense of reducing spiritual things, and thus are not, as the scriptures say, rich toward God, then it's too far. See, that's using the freedom we have in Christ, which says, yes, you've got to take care of your own as an inducement for the flesh to accumulate more and more material things. And this is clearly a problem with some today. That's why this is so insidious. In their minds, they may believe they are sowing with a view to the spirit, God's spirit, but when you look at the opportunities they're losing for studying God's Word and attending the meetings and assemblies and building their spirituality, and this is sacrificed because of accumulating or using spiritual things or joining those in the American dream at the malls and admiring merchandise and material things, and they have made this their way of life, then it goes too far. And that's what he is speaking about here. Taking a casual view of marriage can be the same thing. Nothing's wrong with marriage. God performed the first one. But he says, marry in the Lord. Some abuse that. And they may use as an excuse, well, I tried. You know how these brothers are. And you know the rest of the story. And this is why they tell you about this guy they met at work. How nice he is. And he's going to study, too. <laughs> Well, you see, it's too far because you have what God says, marry only in the Lord. And then when you come to this matter of marriage, it's to be permanent. But we see proliferating among us separations and divorces such as never before in the modern day history of Jehovah's people. Now, that is not to say that there are not valid grounds the Bible gives for separation and divorce. But... When you stand back from that and see who's splitting up, not on the basis all the time of what the Bible says. Why, you, you hear the simple reason, I don't have to put up with this. That's a worldly ground for separation. But according to God's word, married people should work out differences, get help if they need it, apply the principles of God's word, influenced by his spirit, and they're sowing then with a view to God's spirit, not their own flesh, that if circumstances are unpleasant to any mild degree, I don't mean significant or gross, because I don't want anybody coming up and saying, let me tell you what he was doing to me. See, well, maybe that was bad enough to leave, but that's not what we're talking about, and that's not what we generally see. We see personal preference dictating whether people stay or go. Now, I think we have the point. The point is clear, that if we are sowing with a view to God's Spirit, 
We have the principles in his word that will govern whatever we're doing, whether it's entertainment, whether it's how we arrange our life and finances from uh, the point of view of individual taste, the view we take of marriage, divorce, it goes on and on and involves everything. So the Christian way is neither extreme, neither living a life of legalism, slamming the truth to please us, in a judgmental, overly scrupulous way. And neither have we been given this freedom by Christ so as to abuse it and please our flesh in things that are not legitimate from God's point of view just because he doesn't call a law that requires disfellowshipping or putting out of the congregation. So then we come to the fundamental and final question here then. We see how this Christian freedom is not to be used. But the question is, and see if you know, why did he give it to us and how are we to use it? If you're a dedicated servant of God, you've been given this freedom, the truth that sets you free. We know how not to use it, but question how is it to be used? Now, here's the surprise answer. I don't know what you thought of, but here's the surprise answer. We already read it. We didn't emphasize it. But we put it out there. Did you take note of it? Take a look at it again. Go back to chapter 5 in Galatians. You're probably right there now. Now, see, verse 13, we read it all, but now I'm going to go right down to the latter part of it. That's what tells us how this freedom is to be used, where it says, but through, are you following me? Love. Now, what did it say do? Slave for one another. That's why we were given this Christian freedom. Is that not what Christ did? Did he not slave for his followers and put himself in a license of service? That's why we have been given Christian freedom. Point. Not to indulge our own passions, but in a way of showing mutual love and concern to put ourselves in the service of our brothers and sisters. And look at verse 14 that follows it when it says, For the entire law stands fulfilled in one thing, namely, you must love your neighbor as yourself. So that means helping our neighbor. We go out and we tell them the good news about God's kingdom and we try to show them the truth. But that's a service. So the service, though, starts among ourselves. This mutual love and concern that we're to have for each other, he said, slave for one another. We want to be serviceable in the congregation, doing what is going to be helpful to others. Through love, it says, slave for one another. Now, let me tell you who in particular. Follow this. Those in the congregation who have special needs. And that there are helpful services we can perform for them. Who are these? I'll give a little list. Orphans, widows, that is fatherless boys and girls, handicapped persons, infirm, those who are sick, those who are shut in, those who are poor financially, those who are weak spiritually, those who are bereaved or grieving because they've lost someone in death, those who are friendless, They don't have any friends. Maybe they just came to the congregation. Those who are single parents. Those who are defenseless and vulnerable from the standpoint of the world. Those who are suffering trial by way of some temptation or some evil coming their way. Those who have problems mentally or emotionally or physically. Quite a list. In fact, if you look at it objectively, all of us are probably on there somewhere or the other. (laughs) <laughs> you may get on and get off, but things happen. And, <laughs> and the point is to show that that's what we're to be doing, to see who has a special need and render help. When the natural tendency, even from the standpoint of the world, is to draw away. Here's a little point. I just copied it here from the Watchtower. I thought it was that good. December 195 on page 17, here's what it said. When there is an ongoing need for such aid, now notice ongoing, it poses a real test of the genuineness of our love. 
Instead of drawing away from the needy ones because of the time and effort involved, may we pass the test of Christian love by being sensitive and responsive to the needs of others. What a wonderful thing to have this Christian freedom. And look how we can always be working it in the congregation, sensitive and concerned to who has a need, and then out in the field, taking this truth that sets us free to others. And, of course, in doing that, what are we showing? We're showing that we're sowing with a view to the Spirit, God's Spirit. God loved all of this mankind and all of us so that he was willing to have his son die. What greater love? And so he gives us the opportunity, as we read there, through love, he says, slaves then for one another. Now, do not doubt this. You're going to be rewarded. If you're sowing with a view to God's spirit, if you're putting out there what's good, look in chapter 6. What an encouragement. It says, don't give up doing what is fine. Don't be like that prisoner sitting in jail, sowing prison guard with a needle and a thread, but reflecting on his life. I'm in here because of all the bad I did. That's just a small scale. The bigger picture is how God is going to reward or not reward according to our lifestyle. Those rewarded are those who are sowing with a view to God's spirit. It said they're going to reap everlasting life. That's the end goal. That's the result of mutually slaving for one another with this Christian freedom we have. But remember this, and it's telling. We will harvest in proportion to what we are sowing. We are not going to harvest because of what we intended to sow. And you know, some are like that. They're always going to do better next month. They'll get things straightened out soon. And then they're going to do better. They're always intending to do these things. They don't get around to them. And it's not going to be according to what you thought you had sown. See, there's some like that. Well, I thought I was really the most righteous one. In the current, I thought I was lifted up. I was denying myself all of this. You see, they thought they were doing it. They were not. And it's not going to be based on what we should have sown. Our reward is going to be based on what we actually have sown. You don't change that principle. It's immutable. It won't change one iota for any person anywhere. Time, distance, nothing changes it. It has been put in place by God. No one should be misled into thinking you can live one kind of life and then you can reap or harvest for a completely different kind of life. It does not work that way. You will reap what you sow.